I did not when I signed I think I signed up to preach first and then we decided to do a commissioning today so I didn't mean for it to all you know come together like that but it has um, so I'm excited to share with you guys today uh, that passage talks a lot about antichrists and when I think of the word antichrist I think about the Left Behind series of books that was popular, you know, in the late 90s. Um, and I probably think about that because I worked at a Christian bookstore and I spent many, many hours unloading these boxes of books so that people could come in and buy them. Um, and people were really, really into it because it was, you know, a speculative novelization of what the end times might look like. And um, people were really, uh, I think, curious to know like even just what, what's one possible version of, of what that could look like um and i wish kind of that i had kept them or read them in more detail because i would really like to know how it parallels you know our current dumpster fire of a world but i, I don't i don't care enough to go back and read them so i'm not going to do that um what comes into your mind when you hear the word uh antichrist Go ahead and pop a note in the chat bar and if you would like to say anything. Yeah, pop a note in a chat and I'll unmute, I'll unmute you. That's how it works if you've not been here before. Oh, yeah, Nikolai Carpathia. I mean, yeah, like I still remember that name, Jill. Why is that name taking up space in my brain? Okay, yes. Um, <laughs> Jen, <laughs> Jen. Um, I think of somebody who um, like it's beyond, it's beyond just prideful, um, like like they are the new gift which uh trump's previous mm, maybe expectations or what we know to be true somebody that represents a shift or a change or something mm -hmm. yeah val um, growing up, if we ever heard the term antichrist, I don't know, it's kind of like a boogeyman type thing, like this, like this evil person, spirit thing, the antichrist. Um, so it's, it's kind of a little bit comical to me when I hear that term, because it seems like something that's like fantastical or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Like a Bond villain is what I think of. A religious bond villain. Uh, anybody else before I move on? Jen again. Yes, come back, Jen. <laughs> uh, okay, but it also makes me think um, about like sort of um, in in Christianity or you know in my upbringing um, anything anything that the community discerns as naughty, you know, is like, you know, wrapped up in the, you know, he's the antichrist, he thinks the LGBTQ are, you know, <laughs> are okay, and uh. So it also, I feel like, you know, is like inclusive of all these things that people just don't like. Mm -hmm. Yep, Marquila. Duncan. Okay. Oh, hey. There you go. Um, <clears throat> it makes me think of manipulation and like uh, cult leaders like Jim Jones and David Koresh and just uh, um, a manipulation of our need for God. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, Jill. 
John Oliver. Uh, yeah. John Oliver, last one, and then we're going to move. Tell me. Come on. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> my first many years in Christ, I was on the charismatic side. And uh, there's a certain uh, group of what subset within them that obsess about prophecy. That's all they think about all day and all night. And every time there, there's a blip in the news, they're sure that that person is Antichrist. And they preach about it. They write books about it, particularly like uh, Saddam Hussein was like, for sure, for sure, no doubt about it. He is the Antichrist. And, and, and it's like, and, but, but then a few years later, the next Antichrist comes on, the next one, the next one, the next one. I just got sick and tired of all that mess. Um, mm -hmm. And they're always looking at, at Israel and the headlines and the Bible and Revelation and, and Daniel and try to make it all suddenly say, boom, we've got it. We have finally nailed down the Antichrist. Definitely. No doubt about it. No doubt. Conferences. Fill up the auditorium. Sell my books. Buy my tapes. I went, and I, and I, I was amused by it, but I finally got sick and tired of it and said, I'm not here any more of that. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Y'all, y'all drew out a lot of similar things that I think about. Like it's a kind of a future looking forward thing. Like you're looking to see, you know, what's the end of the world going to look like? You kind of associate that word with it. And it, like Jen said, um, a lot of times it can just become associated with people who believe things that we don't like uh, or that we feel threatened by within, you know, the community of believers. And so um, John's talking about it today, John, not John Oliver, John in our passage. Um, and I think that he really kind of hones in on the idea of Antichrist because he's talking about little a Antichrists um, as sheep sort of in wolf's clothing, you know, people who, uh, I think, I can't remember who said like cult leaders, like charismatic leaders who maybe we trust, and then we find out that in fact they have been deceiving us. Uh, and um, because a lot of us have been, a lot of us and a lot of people in the world have been hurt by um, church leaders or hurt by people in our faith communities who um, uh, kind of, yeah, turn out to be sheep's in wol wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, we start to lean toward this idea, kind of like what John Oliver said of um, creating a checklist and evaluating people. So maybe we're not, uh, maybe those of us who aren't like super charismatic or have a different view of the end times, maybe we're not making a list of the things that um, an end times antichrist, the person who's going to, you know, ultimately consign the world to Satan or whatever, we're not making a list to determine what that looks like, but because we've been hurt, we're looking for a list of ways to uh, uh, know who that who we can trust in our faith communities. Um, we don't want to be hurt, and so the idea that someone in our faith community could betray us, could think something differently than us that is hurtful to us, um, I think it keeps us on guard, and. Um, I want to look at what John says because I think John lived in a faith community in uh, in like with Jesus and with Jesus's other followers, where that happened, where um, people did do kind of some crazy things. People did betray Jesus, and um, John in this passage does says that it's not a list. He doesn't give us a list and say, well. If a person does this, this, and this, don't trust them. If a person does this, this, and this, you can believe in them. Um, he says, abide in the truth you already know. And he says, abide in Jesus. Um, so because of that, I want us to spend just a little time today, uh, instead of looking at a checklist, um, I want us to abide in Jesus a little bit. So I asked uh, Sharon to kick us off uh, sharing a story about Jesus from the Gospel of John. And then I'm going to share, and then Marquila is going to share the story. So, Sharon. Okay. Um, the story that I'm going to summarize is in John 6, 60 through 70. Um, and what had happened right before this is when um, Jesus tells people, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. My flesh is real food and my blood 
Israel drink. And that was really hard for people to hear. Um, he said it when he was in a synagogue. So he was in a place of authority and he was talking to a whole bunch of people. And they did not like that. People got upset. That was really hard to hear. Um, and so it says the disciples found that really difficult. So it was more than the 12. It was a bunch of people who were following him. And it says they were complaining, different words and different versions. I mean, it's, it feels like people got pretty angry. Like this was, this was a huge deal. People were not comfortable. Um, and so Jesus asked them, does this offend you? Um, the spirit gives life, not human effort. Um, these are the words of the spirit. And he knew that some didn't believe. He knew who would betray him. So he added, no one can come to me unless the father allows him. And after that, many of the disciples left. They didn't want to follow him anymore. They did not want to associate with him anymore. Um, the 12 remained. And so Jesus asked them, do you also want to leave? And Peter said, where would we go? You tell us about eternal life and we believe you are the Holy one of God. And Jesus said, you know, I chose you. One translation says I handpicked you. And yet one of you is a devil. And he said that because he knew that Judas was going to betray him. Thank you, Sharon. So um, another day Jesus was, uh, it was a Sabbath day of religious rest and Jesus was uh, talking with people in the temple and the religious leaders who were there and the other religious people were arguing with him and the argument got so heated that eventually they started picking up stones to throw at him and so he hid himself and he went out of the temple and as he was walking along away from the temple he saw a man who was blind from birth and his followers said uh Teacher, who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents that he was born blind? And he said, well, no one sinned. Um, he was born blind so that God's glory would be revealed in him. And then he spit on the ground and he made mud out of the spit <laughs> and he put it on the guy's eyes. And then he told the man to go wash in a pool and the man went and washed and he was able to see. Um, and his neighbors and the people that he knew were all like, is this the guy that was born blind? Cause he can see now. And um, some people were saying, yes, it's him. And other people were saying, no, well, I mean, it can't be him because he is able to see. So obviously this cannot be the man who was born blind. And he said, I'm the man. But they kept questioning about it. Um, and they said, how did this happen? And he said, well, there was this man who made spit mud and put it on my eyes. And then I was able to see. Um, and I said, where is he? And he said, I don't, I don't know. And then the religious leaders heard about this. Um, and they knew who Jesus was, and they knew who had done it, so they brought um, the man who had been born, born blind, and they said, well, Jesus did this work on the Sabbath, which was against the religious law, and some of them said, well, Jesus can't be from God because he did this. Uh, he's obviously a sinner, and a sinner can't do anything um, in the name of God or do any miracles like this, um, and so they didn't believe they, they either believe that yeah they didn't believe that the man had been healed because they were like it's not possible uh so they brought the man's parents in and they said it was your son born blind and they said yes and I said and what's happened to him now he said well he's not blind anymore and they was like well what what happened though and they're like well hey you can ask him so they bring the man back in and there's all this they're asking him and they just can't believe that's what what's happening and what he's saying. And he says, here's a crazy thing. Finally, he tells them, uh, you don't know where Jesus comes from, but he opened my eyes. Uh, we know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he does listen to someone who worships him and obeys him. Um, and if this man wasn't from God, I don't think he could do anything. And so then the religious leaders got super mad at him and threw him out. And when Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out, he found him and he said, do you believe in the son of man? And the man said, yes, tell me who he is and I'll believe. And Jesus said, well, it's me, I'm talking to you. And the man said, Lord, I do believe. Mm -hmm. Markeela. 
Yes. Well, then my story picks up from there. And so then Lazarus is sick. And so messages are sent to Jesus from Mary and Martha. Our brother is dead. And Jesus is like, I love these people. So I'm going to wait two more days before I go and check on them. And when he mentions to his disciples that he's going to go to Bethany, they're like, okay, we just, you almost got stoned when we went in that direction. Do we really want to go there? And Jesus is like, yeah, we're going to go. And in going, he's like, you know, Lazarus is asleep and I'm going to awaken him. And so the disciples are like, if he's asleep, he'll wake up. So he had to explain that he's not just asleep, that he's dead. So, you know, Jesus goes, when he gets there, Martha runs out, Jesus, you know, I'm so glad you're here. Um, if you had been here, you know, my brother wouldn't have, you know, my brother would be alive. My brother would be well. And Jesus said he will rise again. And Mary being Martha, I'm sorry, Martha stayed at the house <laughs> for whatever reason. She stayed at the house mourning, everybody's crying. And so Martha runs out, if you had been here, and Jesus says, You'll ri he'll rise again. She said, yes, Lord, on that great day, the day of the resurrection. And he says, which was really, I think, important, he says, I am the resurrection in life. And he asked her, I feel like it was an important question. He said, um, I'm sorry, I wrote it down. He said, I am the resurrection in the life. And then at the end, he says, do you believe this? He says, um, whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes. I don't think she really believed. I don't think she really understood what he was asking, what he was talking about. Because finally, she goes to get Mary and is like, you know, the, 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 the Lord wants to see you. So she runs out. And so Mary says the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And so finally, Jesus says, take me to him because he's crying and he's, he's weeping. He, this is the, the one verse where every little kid can memorize Jesus wept. <laughs> so, um, so everybody that's around is like, oh man, he really cared. He really cared for, um, this guy, but then some of them said, you know, if he can raise, if he can heal a blind man, you know, he could have kept this man from dying. Why didn't he show up? And then so finally he takes them, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And then, you know, he's still wrapped up, his hands are bound, his feet are, feet are bound, and he says, unbind him. And in that moment, they unwrap him. And that moment, Jesus can, says, you know, I told you. I told you I was going to believe this. And everyone that's around that sees what he does, believe everything he did from the moment he says, I, I'm not going to go. I'm going to wait a couple of days to the point that he gets there and it's four days later and there's an order. <laughs> All that to say so that they could believe, so they can see the resurrection in the life. Thank you, Markula. Thank you, Sharon. Um, what did you guys notice in these stories about um, how Jesus interacts with people? And maybe not, um, there are a lot of them are about belief and people's belief in Jesus. Are there any ways that you see that Jesus um, had faith and trust in people? And any other thoughts? We can keep it open ended. Uh, oh, hey, okay, Dasha, Dasha, was that from before? Okay, so Sharon, I'm sorry, Dasha, Sharon. Um, one of the things that I think interesting when when there's a like belief issues, that Jesus often like asks a question back. Like people ask him a question instead of just being like, "Well, let me tell you how it is." Um, he asks them a question back and he's curious about what they're thinking and where they are. So like when you just said, does he have faith in them? Like, I guess he's, he's trusting them to be, he, like, he knows they're in a process and he's letting them be in that process instead of just being like, here's the deal guys. Why don't you see it? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. 
Anybody? Anybody else? Jen. And yeah, Jen and then Dasha, yeah. Or Dasha and then Jen, either one. I'll let y'all just fight it out. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, like when I think about questions about the Antichrist that we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, like he's literally going against all the religious people, you know, like, I mean, like in the first couple stories, you know, you know, he's saying, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, you know, and I feel like you know, what we were talking about, like, that's, that's the essence of a, an antichrist, someone who's like, well, no, that's not it. This is it. And they're like, oh, <gasps> um, so, you know, following Jesus seems like sketchy business because he's not doing it right. It, that is so true. <laughs> that is so true. He's not the one that like fits in. Yeah. Dasha. Hi guys, it's good to see everyone. Um, we're surviving the wildfires in San Francisco. Um, I wanted to say that um, I, you know, like it never made sense to me why Jesus cried there. And I mean, I understand like being surrounded by people who are crying kind of sometimes can move you to tears, but I mean, he knew he was gonna, he knew what he was gonna do. You know, he knew that he was gonna raise Lazarus from the dead. And so, I heard one interpretation. I mean, I don't know if it's like true, but it kind of resonates with me that he actually cried not because Lazarus died, but rather because of people's unbelief, because he was trying over and over again to show that he's the Lord of bread and the Lord of the storm and, you know, the Lord of life and death and, um, you know, who could open the eyes of the blind and people saw it and every time there was a new challenge there was a new measure of unbelief he had to overcome you know that, that that faith did not translate to different kind of types of situations among the disciples and consistently he calls them you of little faith you know <laughs> you of little faith and so um but i i also on the on the antichrist uh, thing i i feel like and kind of also what John was talking about with the charismatics, um, I think it can be abused very easily where people could say, like when you encounter something that just does not sit well with you, people oftentimes say, well, you know what? People didn't believe Jesus, you know, and he was so different and, you know, um, you're just of little faith. <laughs> and so I, I think, I think God calls us to worship him in, in spirit and in truth. And so I think he doesn't, um, even though Jesus did ask them to believe, there was also, you know, 1200 years worth of prophecies about him that were fulfilled it went, in which he was openly fulfilling, you know, as he can, came. And so, so I feel like um, he, he brought in kind of a, a balanced, amount of evidence on both sides on, on sides of the miracles and making things undone which were culturally inappropriate you know but also bringing kind of the truth of the matter in that he was fulfilling what was predicted of him long time ago um Marquila. I think it was encouraging just to just to read again behind the scenes that even though for us things are taking us by surprise, he has a plan. He has he knows fully what he's going to do, how he's going to move, and just being encouraged again that regardless of how it looks to me, he's in control. Ultimately, he's in control and he has my interest at heart that he cares for me, that he cared for them, even though in caring for him, for whatever reason, well, we know the reason, he decided to wait. He decided to wait a little bit longer, but it wasn't because he didn't care, it's because he did care, that he cared more than just the situation at hand. He had an eternal plan. And so because of an eternal plan, I have to wait so that 
you can see the glory of God so that your faith may re be restored or your faith will be built up and not just your faith, but even those who are on looking in this situation that there are so many different factors are going on. Just know that I am at work in all those factors and I'm in control. That's just as encouraging to know that he's in control. Yes. I um when I just two comments or the last two comments relating to the story of Lazarus and kind of my thoughts on it and it's just even sort of connecting to communion like what Charles said um I when I was reading this story this time I was really struck with how Jesus seemed to believe in the ability of Mary and Martha to be resilient um of Lazarus's friends and families to be resilient you know like he might have known what he was going to do um but I think it's possible that part of why he wept is similarly to what Charles said like he he's a god who sits with us in our pain right and um I think he's sitting with them in their pain but there are hard times when I have gone through really hard things and I thought Jesus, if you knew that everything was going to be okay in the end, why did you let me go through this trauma? Because we do carry trauma from things, even if the end ends up being okay, we carry trauma from it and then we have to deal with it and then it starts affecting our other relationships and it just becomes this whole ball of stuff that's not even related to one particular event. And I thought as I read this that I just was struck by how Jesus believed in Mary and Martha's ability to rebound, right? <laughs> and that he was going to be with them through that rebounding. Um, uh, so, okay, Jen, what, Jen? Uh, Jen, and then we'll wrap it up and go on. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Yeah, so um, what you were saying about Charles's comments about um, Jesus being with them, being with us in our pain, you know, I feel like um, in that Lazarus story, I, I feel like he's an example of being present. And, you know, like, just because we know that things will turn out in the end, like this moment is hard and devastating. Like, you know, like, Jesus loves Lazarus like deeply and so you know like it's it is sad and devastating that everybody you know didn't want him to die you know like Jesus didn't want him to die everybody you know in that home uh is devastated and I appreciate that he was devastated even though he was like well it's gonna be fine but like in this moment in this present moment, it's devastating. It's sad. So I just, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you guys so much. It was, I had a whole bunch of stuff written about like, well, this is what the stories say, but as usual, you all like got out of it with the stories say. So thank you so much. Um, as we're thinking about these, uh, in all of the stories, there's kind of some semblance of Jesus sort of believing in people and um, not getting rattled by resistance that he encounters. So like he encounters resistance in his own group. He knows that someone in his own group is going to betray him. He encounters resistance from the culture and yet he trusts a man that he just, you know, met on the side of the road and healed to go in and to be he, like Jesus is kicked out of the synagogue and then out of the temple, and then he goes and heals a man who is then immediately brought back into the temple to testify about him and to argue again with these religious leaders and say, no, this guy really is from God. And I just think about how Jesus like delegates all this sort of responsibility um, to people that he does often call faithless. Um, he calls them faithless sometimes, but he's considering that he says faithless, he gives them an awful lot of responsibility and he puts an awful lot of trust in their, you know, ability to be his witnesses and to be his followers and that kind of thing. And um, uh, 
I think if we are abiding with Jesus and walking as he walked, then um, our identity and our, our sense of safety has to come not from um, the community around us, although it does play a role in our sense of safety, but it has to come from um, our identity in Jesus. And then when we have that, we are free to believe in other people um, and to love them where they are, even if we can't see um, where they're going to be. Uh, we're free to trust them and not to always be looking around thinking, are you a wolf in sheep's clothing? Are you going to betray us? Are you going to hurt me? Um, when we're afraid to believe in each other, we may build up a culture where none of us gets hurt, um, where none of us are re-traumatized like we've been in the past by church, by religious leaders, but we also lose the ability to be open about our own dreams, um, to be open about our own struggles. We lose the opportunity to build each other up with belief. And I think that belief in that sense can be equated with loving each other in a really radical way. Uh, and I think that that's what we see in the life of Jesus is that um, he loved people in a really radical way. Um, that, that wraps it up for me. Um, I think I have mission prayers. Oh no, I'll pray first. I'll pray first. Let me pray first. Um, Lord God, thank you so much for, um, giving us the wonderful stories about Jesus and not just giving us a checklist, um, but giving us a dynamic, living, complicated example of um, your heart for our world, your heart for us. Um, God, thank you for believing in us uh, when we are not sure if we can do what you've called us to do. Um, please enable us to believe in the people around us. Um, God, build our community up in love and in trust. In your name I pray. Amen.